morning. Um, morning. 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 I promise a raucous audience, so uh, we'll all be out of your seats in a minute. Uh, I just want to say uh, it's lovely for us to be here. I thank you all for taking the, the time out to, uh, to join uh, this event this morning, and, and thanks for laying it on. Um, there's never been a more important time to take good information and good data and to blend it with your own skills and your own experience to create uh, insights and meaningful direction for your business and your businesses. And uh, that's exactly what uh, the organisation that Jan and I work for does effectively, IRI. Um, Jan works across a whole bunch of categories and a whole bunch of businesses, many of whom are in the room today, to deliver that, that information and those insights to help you grow. And uh, from my point of view, my team looks more then at the macro situation and how channels as a whole uh, across grocery and liquor and convenience and pharmacy are uh, developing. So in a minute you're going to hear from a Dutchman and uh, then you're going to hear from an Englishman again. Uh, not just about what's going on locally and uh, regionally, but uh, a little bit about what's going on more broadly across the world. And hopefully at the end of that you'll be left with some ideas and some uh, tips maybe that you can then take back to the businesses to, uh, to do something with. So with that, it's over to Jan, the man. <laughs> Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. It's good to be here today in South Australia. You can see such a big turnout with so many familiar faces in the crowd. Welcome. Today I want to talk with you a little bit about the connected consumer. But before we start, I'm just curious to see how connected we all are here today. Right. Can I please ask you to raise your hand if you are at work or at home in some way connected to the internet, whether it's a phone or a laptop or anything else? Almost everyone, right? <laughs> in Australia, 9 out of 10 people are connected to the internet. And that's actually a lot higher than most countries in Europe. On the world scale, 4 out of 10 people are connected, so we're actually a very connected country here. Can I please ask you to raise your hand again if you ever bought any groceries online? Quite a few people in the room as well. That's a lot more than the, uh, the average you see here in Australia. And then I assume that most people here, both the ones that didn't raise their hand for groceries, bought anything ever online, whether it's flights, services, goods, or anything else. Almost everyone? Good. Very connected audience. I think you can easily relate to the topic that we're going to talk about today. Before we dive into the content, there are three key takeaways that I would like you to remember of today's presentation. First of all, if you want to win in today's environment, you have to be online. Second is, in order to win online, you have to partner with retailers, with retailer websites. And the third point is, you have to align. Align your brand, your service, your product, with social media, on, with influencers, with bloggers, with brand ambassadors. And why is this so important? Well, within a couple of years, 8 out of 10 purchase decisions will be made online. 80% of the purchase decisions. That doesn't mean that 8 out of 10 people will go online and buy a product. It will mean that 8 out of 10 people go online and compare reviews, for example, to decide which skincare product to buy. Or 8 out of 10 people jump online to read recipes and decide what the groceries they're going to buy tonight to have for dinner. As you can see here, all we already have a very connected audience. And let's see how connected everyone is, because we are now more connected than ever. In just one internet minute, 700,000 people will look into Facebook. 150 million emails will be sent across the globe. Over 20 million WhatsApp messages will be sent. Over half a million Snapchat photos will be sent. 40,000 Instagram pictures. I like this one as well. Every single minute, a million swipes left to right on Tinder. That's a lot of connection there. 2.8 million YouTube videos will be watched every single minute. And finally, very relevant here, every single minute, Amazon sales are over a quarter of a million Australian dollars. Right? It's now just before 11, so when the morning ends here at 12, Amazon will have sold almost 18 million dollars worth. Very significant play. If you think about what success looks like for the companies here behind me, what's one of their measures for success? That is share of attention. So all of us here, we only have so much attention to give in a day. And the more attention these companies behind you here can capture, the more money they will make of you. And they're extremely successful in doing so. We are now more connected than ever. On average, we spend six hours a day online. 
if you think if you sleep seven or eight hours a day, then you still have 16 hours left, almost 40% of your waking hours you're online, you're connected. 48% of the people say they would be unable to function without their smartphones. Right? When I walk around, when I see a lot of people here so on the iPads, on their phones, I think 48% is actually a very low number. It feels like everyone is glued to a screen or a phone the whole day almost. Almost one in two people say they're early adopters of technology. Yeah, those are the people you expect outside of an Apple store when there's a new iPhone launched, waiting in line to get the first, uh, first new phone. One in three of the people already use a mobile phone to pay for purchases. I've been just over a year now here in Australia. I don't see it too often yet that people pay with a phone. But when I lived in London, when I lived in the UK, I didn't even have a wallet anymore. No cards, all I had was my phone, all my colleagues had the same. You had Apple Pay, everywhere you go, you just tap your phone, you're done. It's very easy, very convenient. <coughs> and for your businesses today, I think the last fact is also really interesting. Over one in two people prefer <coughs> updates from you, from your brand, your communications, via email instead of text. <coughs> if we ask this question again in five or 10 years, I think this will change. The new generation grows up with text, for them it's normal. However, for now, in terms of your communication, email is for business and text is for friends. And one thing I noticed here, I did some work around online in Europe as well. A lot of FMCG companies here actually <coughs> don't keep a email list of their clients, don't maintain an email list. Well, actually, if you think about it, in terms of targeting your customers, you can do a really segmented approach. You can really target customers with a personalized message. It's a really cheap way. And email, if you look at conversion, which is the amount of people that visit your website and actually buy something, it's a very uh, effective tool to utilize. Might feel a bit old in today's quick digital, digital world, but it's a very effective tool. We're not all equal online. If we look at this slide, one in three Australians say they shop more online this year than last year. Four out of 10 people say they shoot the same, and 16% say they actually shop online less this year than last year. Now, at the beginning, we already saw that Amazon, every single minute, sells over a quarter of a million uh, Australian dollars worth in sales. My expectation is, if we are back uh, next year here again, update this slide, talk about it again, I wouldn't be surprised to see the green number on the top right that five out of 10 people would say, or even more, say they shop online. I expect that Amazon will drive a lot of trial at the beginning, a lot of people will try it, and I expect to see this landscape in Australia slowly changing. Now in a world where we're all very connected, we have to realize that we don't experience being connected and we, that we don't all have the same digital mindsets. And in order to understand which different mindsets there are, it's basically the same idea behind the segments that uh, Liz was already presenting this morning. If we understand which segments there are, we can target them in a more efficient way and connect with them better in the retail environment. So we did, we segmented the shoppers into five different groups. First of all, we have the digitized me segment. They say they fully embraced the digital world. We have the connectors, who say they'd be lost without the smartphones. Then we have the inspiration seekers, who love to browse and find new ideas. The information seekers, who are very happy that they can find all the information they want in just one click. And finally, we have the technophobes. Internet, take it away. <coughs> Our research showed that almost one in four, 22% of those Australian people, fall in the digitized me segment. And this is a key segment because they are really at the forefront of this changing online landscape. We'll get back to them in a second. But let's take a quick step back. Seems like a bit of a busy slide, but I will talk you through it step by step. Let's look at what categories are being sold online and what the penetration of those categories is. In other words, how many shoppers do buy which categories online? If we start at the top, we have our online staples in Australia. This is your travel, your books, your clothes, your footwear. And we see that those categories have the highest penetration. Then there's a slight drop off again to what we classify as non edibles your pet supplies, your office supplies, your vitamins, your minerals. And then we see a drop off again when it comes to the edibles. This is your groceries, your fresh, and your alcoholic beverages. And as you already mentioned this, alcoholic consumption in Australia purchased online is still relatively low here with 17% penetration. <coughs> it is quite interesting though, this slide, because 
it shows that digital shopping habits in Australia are still very much developing. However, as we just established at the start, the foundation is here. Nine out of ten people are already connected. And we are connected almost the whole day. One of the biggest challenges online retailers and e-commerce websites face is a problem that's online known as the last mile. The last mile is basically <coughs> the delivery of the product to the customer's home. Nowadays, that's very costly and it often takes a lot of time. Why is it so important to get it right? Well, we saw at the beginning that the digitized meat segments, almost 24 people in Australia, are really at the forefront of online shopping. And what they're after, what well, their expectation is, is really instant gratification. They buy something, they want it now. We can see that companies <coughs> in Australia that deliver that instant gratification, for example, the Iconic, a large uh, sportswear and fashion retailer, they're really successful in delivering instant gratification, and they're one of the fastest growing Australian businesses. For a small fee, they offer three to five hour delivery. You order it at two o'clock from the office, and at five, it will be at your home. Amazon traditionally has been very strong in this as well. So I expect with the arrival of Amazon, I'm sure many of you will have read a lot about it, will it change the retail landscape, something that won't have a lot of impact. The official launch date is not yet confirmed. But I expect that the penetration of many of these categories will increase because they're really good in delivering that instant gratification. If you're a Prime member, you can get same day delivered. Existing online retailers, let's say Coles as an example, have the same problem. They, they also face the challenge of the last mile. And they really try to tap into existing ecosystems. They really try to leverage existing distribution systems. Last week an article came out <coughs> where it was discussed that Coles partners with Airtasker. Now people can put their online shopping list online at Airtasker, assign a budget to it. Someone can take up the job at Airtasker and deliver the uh, groceries to the customer at home. You can see that there are a lot of companies are really trying to close that mile um, and figuring out ways to make the solution more efficient and a lot quicker as well. Now, with us all being so connected, with online shopping habits changing in Australia so rapidly, the path to purchase really changes as well. It's no longer linear. There's no longer a set pre-shop, shop, and post-shop. The picture behind me, I read the description that I thought was quite fitting for it, looks more like an uh, airline route map. It goes a lot of back and forth, goes a lot around the circles. And if you think about your own path to purchase, you maybe can relate to that. You might go to a store, you might then check online for some reviews, you might um, watch some videos about some, some products if it would suit, fit your needs best, or you might be influenced by, by a blogger or a news website you follow. It might look complicated, this to purchase, but it actually presents us as companies, as brands, with a lot of opportunities. Now we can really engage with customers along the way. Ideally, we can drive them down the to purchase and engage with them all the way along the to purchase. We can send them Personalized email messages when they're hungry and looking to decide what to buy for dinner, for example. We can follow them with targeted ads uh, online. We can, with a delivery, we can customize it to what customer it is. We can do click and collect customer orders online, and then we can build a relationship with them in store or uh, at another location where they can pick up the goods. And it's changing what to purchase is, is essential to understand in terms of how you build your communication of your brand, of your product online, but also offline. Let's use an example. Let's go back to our digitized me segment. And uh, let's give her a name, just to tell, tell a bit of a story that I can easily relate to. Let's call her, let's call her Alicia. That's someone, it's not her picture, but it's someone I know very well, and I can relate to how her product purchase could go. So Alicia, she works very hard, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. And at 4 PM, like many Australians, she has still no idea what to have for dinner that night. So like 17 million other Australians, she's connected to social media. It's almost eight out of 10 people in Australia are connected to social media. She browses for some ideas, reads through some recipes, and there's calls having an advertisement for a half price chicken. She doesn't straight close the phone and drive the calls, right? She's a savvy shopper, jumps online quickly to the website of Woolworths, checks if there's an even better deal. In this case, there isn't. Afterwards, she drives the calls, and like a true digitized me shopper, she loves to browse the aisle, look if there's some new products there, look for some inspiration, and in this case, a, um, another product, let's say a vegetable stir fry disc, catches her eye, decides that's a better choice, picks it up, doesn't stand in line for the checkout, of course, goes to a self-service checkout, calls is successful in selling her some more um, stuff there, so she buys a tasty, let's say, sneakers bar, right? Health and indulgence, healthy stir fry, have to balance it out with some 
uh, takes the snap. She goes home, loves her food, jumps online at the calls website, leaves a review, or at her message board, or some website she follows, communicates about um, her experience, and of course a meal is not a meal. If you don't take a picture of it, and one of those 40,000 pictures that go online on Instagram, <laughs> I find it extremely frustrating. That it's we have to take pictures of our food now all the time. <laughs> and other people that go online, those 8 out of 10 people that go online later to decide what to have for dinner that night or what to buy, they will be influenced by Alicia's reviews, by her star rating of the product, by the pictures that she shares with her friends. And this part of purchase will happen again the next day. Next day is 4 p.m. again, and the cycle will repeat. She might need inspiration for a different location. Maybe there's a birthday party to go to that night. And she wants to know what wine will make the best gift, for example. Now, three out of four people have used online resources more this year than last year. And we already see that almost everyone in the room is here connected. There's one interesting thing that you have to think about in terms of your communication, in terms of connecting with a connected consumer. Consumers are more likely to search retail websites than manufacturing websites. If I look at myself, that would make sense. If a couple of weeks ago I wanted to buy a new pair of headphones, I don't straight jump on the website of Sony, where it's Sony telling me how good Sony is. I go on the website of JB Hi-Fi, for example, or soon I will go on Amazon, compare some reviews, compare different brands, then I might check again on the website of Sony to see if there's some, some new products out. But I will go on retailer websites. If I want to buy some Mars, if I want to buy some ice cream, if I want to buy some liquor, I'm more likely to search retailer websites than manufacturer websites. Seems to make sense, but often I'm surprised um, that when I talk to FMCG companies in Australia, that they actually spend a lot of money on developing their own website, on developing their own web store. Doesn't mean it's a bad investment. Maybe it's not the best return on investment, right? That could be a consideration. But it's interesting to think about partnering with retailer websites. How would that look like for you? For example, if your product is on Woolworths, as the screenshot is here behind me, think about partnering with them to ensure that your products have high definition pictures, that the product description is right, that they have your logo. Or, if you negotiate your training terms, make sure that part of the conversation is the position on the website. If you're featured, or if there's a relevant search uh, result and your product is on the top of the page so the customer doesn't have to scroll down, you will see a great uplift in sales. Same as store, right? If you have a gondola end or off location, you expect sales to rise? Same online. Make sure it's part of your conversation. So if 8 out of 10 purchase decisions will be made online, how do you win the connected consumer? To repeat what we kind of just said, leverage, leverage websites as marketing and engagement platforms. And I challenge everyone here to really ask yourself the question, ask yourself, what are we doing as a company to deliver a great experience online? And don't just create a webshop, don't just try to get some incremental sales. Really think about delivering a consistent brand experience online. If they go to Woolworths, they get the same brand feel as they would get if they go to your manufacturer's website. What are you doing as a company to deliver that experience? Collaborate. Build brand experiences as you see fit for your brand with retailers. And finally, align. Align your product, your service, your brand with key influencers, brand ambassadors and bloggers. Let them tell your story to their audiences. If you get it right, it is a new, a new way of thinking, it's a new market, it's still very much in development in Australia, but if you get this right, there's a very big opportunity for you to win the connected consumer. Mm -hmm. and as you could see, we are almost all connected nowadays. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, um, welcome to have a chat about it. David? So much to absorb. <laughs> well, maybe one question I have is, so, well, you said that the official launch of Amazon has not been announced yet, but yeah. I guess you guys are, but maybe making some hypothesis of how that can have an impact. For example, I don't know, in the wine um, industry, for example, do you have an yeah, opinion? It will be hypothesis and opinion, exactly right. And I think um, <coughs> what we discussed before on wine is a really good point. That's a bit of a barrier that you have to buy, for example, six bottles at the same time. So we can already see what we saw with Coles stepping into some existing ecosystems. 
In Melbourne, for example, Uber Eats, Uber's delivery service, they already deliver wine to customers as well. You can just order one bottle at a time. I think the fee is around eight dollars, depending on where you live. But you can see that there are already different delivery services out there to make it more efficient. But Amazon, for example, uh, let me use my own example from the UK. I used Amazon Fresh quite a while. And at a checkout there, before I checked out, it often came up, are you sure you want to add this to your basket? And then there often was a bottle of wine in there as well. So easily I could just add in a bottle of wine, get one bottle delivered, and don't have that hurdle to overcome to have to order six bottles or four large amounts at the same time. So I think there's lots of opportunity here. Um, especially once the delivery, the ecosystem, um, will be better, and customers can buy uh, smaller purchases online, and it will be faster delivered, there's a large opportunity there. I'll just add to that as well. Thinking about the journey that they've been on in, uh, in Europe and, and in the UK, for example, they started off with this, this challenge that they had around the delivery costs and the volumes not really stacking up. Then what they did is started to uh, partner with retailers that didn't have a, an online presence of their own already. And what I'm reading about now is that they're actually going out and looking to try and buy retailers. People, in, uh, people who are not performing that well in France, uh, Morrison's in the UK. So if you consider that as, a, as an evolutionary journey, then you're talking two, three, four years down the track. That's the sort of thing you might say. Particularly yeah. because you know I'm, I'm not sure about all the legal aspects about getting liquor licenses mm -hmm. for for Amazon. But yeah. I guess, you know, for example, I mean, I guess this was one of the issues somehow for for Costco that got a liquor license, for example, in Melbourne. But I don't think they have it still in in Adelaide in South Australia. No. Uh, no right. And so you know that once you have a player like this and entering the market, so I don't know with Amazon whether how the all the liquor licensing system is gonna is gonna work. I guess. If they go and buy somebody who already has a legal license, then bingo, maybe. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're clearly cash rich, and they can do that sort of thing, and um, and they are doing that sort of thing. So I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't say it's beyond the realms of possibility to see that uh, sooner rather than later if they're finding barriers to uh, for that. Yeah. Is there any research into online of wine sales, which I'll focus here? in producing countries against non-producing countries normally. So of course the UK is not really a producing country given the rise of sparkling wine. So it's more normal. With the link here in Australia, is there any work around that to see to a difference that people put more of a connection with the winery or they can buy direct, they don't have to necessarily go via? Not that I've seen from, from our point of view, we're less, uh, I suppose we're less connected to the, the production side of things and more the, the retailing side of things. but. Um, uh, it's something we can have a look at, but I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Perfect. Thanks. Thank okay. I'm going to show you. Uh, um, I'll show you what I had for lunch yesterday. I've right? got some photos that I think you'll enjoy. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, <laughs> so, Jan has. Uh, has talked about the connected consumer, and I think that is, is very indicative. Of, uh, of what we see going on, not only in this country, but around the world. And there's undoubtedly something big, uh, something massive, something potentially extremely dangerous, which is taking place in, in Australian retail right now, which is, if it hasn't already, is gonna affect every single person in this room at some point. And that is um, what we can call, sorry, it's a blank one. <laughs> And that's what we can call, uh, <laughs> through me for a minute as well, uh, and that's what we can call fragmentation. And very much as you'd expect if you were uh, um, maybe in the northern part of this state, potentially, you see very dry, very arid earth, you start to see cracks appearing in the landscape. And that landscape can seem very hostile, can seem very harsh, uh, even, even dangerous and, and potentially disastrous for businesses. But if you look a little bit closer, then you will start to see opportunities. There are the opportunities not only to survive, but actually to flourish and to innovate and for businesses to grow in new and exciting ways. And so I'm equally as confident that whilst people in this room may find this daunting in the short term, there will be green shoots and there will be huge opportunities, but you'll have to be looking at the right things and considering doing the right things in your business. 
So a few things that I, uh, I wanted to share with you and explore with you to help you be one of those green shoots. Choice and convenience, value and values, and innovation and inspiration. But before I do that, uh, since it's my first trip to, uh, to Adelaide, to South Australia, uh, I thought I'd better gen up a little bit on, uh, on this proud state. So 13% uh, of the uh, land mass of Australia is, uh, is constituted within South Australia. Uh, as opposed to 7% of the population. And that then compares to 8% of grocery spend. So you're over-indexing a little bit there, helping to drive the economy to some degree. Uh, when we think about uh, groceries and who you shop with, 36% uh, market share is what Coles has in, uh, in South Australia. But you're quite a promiscuous bunch because 51% of you have uh, told us that you shop uh, or did shop in an Aldi in the last 12 months. So you're prepared to give them a a good go. Uh, when we look at the top 10 categories in Australia, <coughs> South Australians over-index in these four. Dairy, cheese, bread and bakery, and deli. <laughs> so what does that tell you about your diets? <laughs> you have a good lunch, right? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting how they all seem to go together. And I thought I couldn't... Uh, I have a presentation like this and uh, not mention uh, some reference of alcohol. So the, the largest segment in, uh, within beer uh, by sales value in South Australia is uh, full strength beer, proper meaty stuff. Um, interestingly though, the second highest um, value component, 19% uh, is low carb. So some of you at least are thinking about your, your waistlines, but there's, there's something interesting going on there. Uh, now the other thing that I've learned about South Australia is that it, is, it's, it was founded and created on, uh, I think, some very innovative principles. The idea of being the first uh, convict-free uh, uh, territory and, and um, settlement in Australia, and the principles of tolerance, uh, racially and, and religious. And so I think it's that kind of innovation that I'm sure still pervades in that sense of looking forward that's going to stand businesses in this part of the country in very good stead. So that brings me to this uh, first topic of choice and convenience. And I'll just uh, allude to my home country. I've only been here four months and I, I still think about the UK quite a bit. But when I do, I see uh, a market that is highly and increasingly fragmented. Uh, okay, Tesco still has 28% market share, but the <coughs> next three players only account for another 40. I mean, you've got another four operators who've got greater than 5% share. And what we're seeing is the biggest stores, the hypermarkets in the UK, are either being mothballed altogether, or they're being broken down and, and hived off to, to repurpose them, to try and ensure uh, return on investments, to try and ensure they're making a bit of money. Uh, you have pure players, obviously, like uh, pure online players, like Ocado and Amazon, uh, gaining incredible traction, huge customer numbers, 45,000 odd convenience stores, many of whom stock a full range of grocery and liquor. Then you've got new options and new ways for, uh, for shoppers and consumers to collect, to get hold of their stuff. Click and collect stations in uh, car parks and tube stations in um, uh, outside stores. You've got this whole concept, which I know is here as well, with uh, meal kits. <coughs> uh, delivery to your door of um, a set of meals, basically pre-prepared for you for the, uh, for the week, so you don't have to do any thinking about the ingredients and go and buying it. And then right on the end, you've got the big players now trialling super fast one-hour delivery slots. Which goes to Jan's point about people really not knowing at four o'clock what they're going to eat at five o'clock. So now Tesco Sainsbury's bringing out apps which will enable you to, uh, to order it and have it delivered within the hour. So you see all of this choice, all this fragmentation going on in the UK. And this is a word that's hard, it's hard to avoid this word. Hardly a day goes by when you don't hear somebody talking about disruption. Disruptive business models, disruptive uh, businesses, disruptive technology. It's really one of those buzzwords that mm, kind of starting to lose a bit of meaning. The way I look at it is, is very similar to something that Jan flashed up here. And it's really this idea that wherever we are in the supply chain, whatever we're doing, it's out silly, but we have to make sure that the customer is at the centre of what we're doing. Strange though that may seem, it hasn't always been the case, whether it's in our stores, in our social media, our traditional media, online, offline, in our supply chain. And another of these buzzwords that you're going to hear a lot more of 
unfortunately for you, I think is omnichannel. It doesn't mean a lot, but it gets used a lot in this context. Actually, this is just about customer centricity. It's just about making sure that the choices and the things that you're doing in your organization appeal to those segments that Liz was talking, the segments that Sir Jan was talking about earlier. And it is the case that this, this concept of fragmentation is occurring right across many, many different facets of industry, from factories to retail to the way media works and the way media is consumed, on into actually the way we operate in organisations and in our businesses, from the cumbersome systems to this idea of agility and thinking much more quickly and rapidly about things. And then on into brands. Sure, global brands still exist, but as I'll touch on in a minute, there's much, much more emphasis on provenance and authenticity. So, then let's look a bit closer to home. When we think about Australia, uh, 2017 undoubtedly been the year when the pendulum has swung back finally in favour of Woolies. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal to me to read 30 periods successively that they were beaten and out, outgrown and outpaced by Coles. And finally, that pendulum has swung back in the other direction. Three quarters now consecutively that Woolies has outgrown Coles and they're enjoying their uh, best results and best performance since 2010, 4.5% growth. Just to put it even in more context, if you think about EBIT, Woolies is enjoying plus 13%, while Coles suffers minus 13%. So a massive, massive pendulum swing that's gone on during the course of this year. But this is all about fragmentation, right? So then you have these guys the fastest growing market for Aldi in the world. And they're expecting double digit growth again this year. It was, it was about 12% last year. Fastest growing market in the world. Store openings <coughs> globally only behind the US and the UK here in Australia. And the MD there is saying, we're gonna keep going. 20 to 25 stores per annum for as far as we can see out into the future. And that's obviously gonna to continue to impact how things play out in uh, newer areas of the country like South Australia, like West Australia. But that's not it. That's not where it ends. Uh, you were mentioning uh, Costco, I think, a moment ago. Uh, nine depots now, I think, is, is what they have. But they're continuing to grow, adding customer numbers, going online as well. And then this little player called Calfland, the world's fourth largest retail group, is going to pop up. Probably not too far from here. I'm sure you all know where it's going to be better than I do. A little bit surprised, that I think, many that, that they've chosen Adelaide. But nevertheless, uh, what you can absolutely be assured of is that these guys know what they're doing. Another incredibly efficient, incredibly effective operator. And if you think it's going to be a sort of pilot high, sell it cheap, bargain basement, shoddy sort of looking thing, there's a couple of uh, store shots from uh, a refurbed Calvin store in Romania. Romania is not exactly the wealthiest demographic in Europe, and yet you can see quality, you can see um, excellent provenance cues just from these two snapshots. So we can certainly expect big stores, we can expect more attack on groceries, um, and a big play in, in terms of general merchandise as well, as if there wasn't enough pressure going to arrive on those kind of guys already. So, I talked about choice, right? Choice and convenience. And You've heard a whole raft of messages from the big players over the last couple of years talking about the need to reduce range. It's quite counterintuitive, potentially, on one level. Now, whether they achieve these kind of levels of 10% range reduction, 15% range reduction, remains to be seen. And we saw Tesco in the UK say this a few years ago, and they ended up at around about probably 3 4 5%. But nevertheless, those MDs coming out and saying, what we have on the shelf edge is too confusing, it's too complex, uh, people can't actually see what we've got there because there's so much, um, so many different products, so much range. And then who's bucking that trend? But again, our friends at Aldi. And I always find it interesting how, for all of the efforts that the traditional players make in going towards the direction of the discounters, gradually you start seeing the discounters moving in the other direction. And it does beg the question, well, do you just want to copy the other guy? And I put that question out to anyone in, the other, in this room as well. Do you just want to copy the other guy? Or do you want to be famous for something different? 
Do you want to strike out a different part? That's just a slight aside. So, uh, range and choice not necessarily synonymous. And when we talk to shoppers, these are some statistics from our shopper panel. Uh, it's kind of borne out. Um, yeah, and again, you were saying, look, people don't really know. We don't know what we're going to eat at any given time. I decide what products to buy when I'm in store. How many people would agree with that statement when you go into store? Quite a lot of us. How many of you find the ranges in, in a lot of uh, categories confusing, bewildering? So I haven't got a clue what's going on. I know a lot of the brands don't mean anything to me yet, but it could be made a lot, lot easier. Uh, I'm quite surprised actually by this, because I think that's, that's, that statistic should be a lot higher. If I asked you how, how many of you feel like you're under pressure, time pressure when you go grocery shopping, I'm sure it's got to be more than 23% of you, but there's definitely a sense, uh, again when Brad Banducci talks about this, that uh, they're just making things too difficult. And as suppliers, we're fueling that, we have fueled that with range extensions, with new variants, making things too difficult for the shoppers that have got to go in, time pressured, not knowing what they want, to try and fathom, try and see the wood from the trees, basically, when it comes to making a purchasing decision. And the reality is that when you reduce range, you don't reduce satisfaction, but you increase efficiency. Now, across all of the categories that we track at IRI, something like 300 across the four channels of grocery, liquor, convenience, and pharmacy, 213 of those have seen their ranges drop over the last 18 months. See, skew count has reduced by, on average, about 6%. And what's happened is that absolute value has gone up by three, and a, an efficiency rating, the dollars per skew, has gone up by nine. So it's had an impact. What's left on the shelf is working harder, people are finding it easier to make those decisions, and conversely, we can pick out those that are not in that group who increased range, and they saw the opposite thing happen. Craft beer is a great example. Skew count has gone up by 25%, and the dollars per skew value has gone down by 10%. A great, great example, if ever there was one, of more just being more, and not working any harder, and not returning what suppliers and what retailers actually want. So, this whole concept of uh, choice and range being synonymous, uh, doesn't really play out, I suppose it plays out to an extent in this chart. This chart is looking at answers to uh, what people felt was extremely important to them when they were choosing where they were going to do their shopping. Now, clearly these two, quality fruit and veggies, fresh meat and poultry, they stand out head and shoulders above the others. But actually, if you highlight location, service, parking, checkouts, these are not product related, right? Okay, there's a bunch of stuff which is. Wide range of products is what, number five. Uh, Australian growing products, promotions, is a kind of value queue. But there are things in there which are not product related. So if we just have this obsession about range, then we're missing a lot of, uh, a lot of the picture which forms the decisions we make about where we're going to shop. And really, what, what this tells me is that not that shoppers and, and consumers are looking for more on shelf. What they're actually looking for is this. They want the right thing at the right time and in the right place. And this is very much to, uh, to Jan's message about the opportunity that exists through digital connectivity. You want to be a supplier or a retailer that is able to offer the right product at the right time in the right place. A meal kit, a meal solution, delivered at the right time, or put into a, a virtual basket for collection later, or whatever it might be the capacity, the ability to offer those options so that when I want to make that purchase of your product, I can not only do it, but I can get the right format, the right variant, I can get it delivered when I want. This is what choice and convenience is all about. So we definitely see more of this. Free quick delivery. I think we're going to see less of this. You're going to read out free when you spend $100 or more, flat $10 fee, under 100 minimum spend. So all these terms and conditions are just not going to work in the coming few years. Because of this fragmentation, people will look at that and they'll go somewhere else. It's very simple. It's what happens in the UK every day. I think we might see more of this. There's a great little operator in uh, Germany called Kochhaus. 
and all of their stores are laid out like this. It's, it's essentially a meal. You've got a big recipe card up on the top, you've got little recipe cards you can take away with you. Great convenience, great freshness, nice and easy. It's kind of this halfway house between uh, doing it for you and doing it yourself. I definitely think we'll see more of this. This is convenience as well. Uh, I don't know why we're not seeing more of this in terms of uh, uh, meal-based merchandising in, in the big stores over here. I definitely think we'll see less of this. <laughs> I was going to spend six bucks. They said there was a charge. They didn't make six bucks. So you, you can't afford to be putting up more barriers with it. And this, this applies whether you're a supplier or a retailer. More barriers, more friction, it's going to turn people away. And in a fragmented market, that spells disaster. Because that person, that shopper won't come back. They won't need to come back. I don't know, does anybody else, it's probably uh, reminiscent of what's behind your TV, maybe at home or uh, down the back of the desk. Um, I flashed this image up to a, a, a loads of suppliers in the UK and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, yeah. The thing is, you don't really know where any of those wires go, right? You don't know what they do. You don't know if you unplug one, what's going to happen. And uh, for a lot of businesses, when you talk about omni-channel, multi-channel, this fragmentation of the market, this is what they start to think of because they've done so much. They've added in so many bits and pieces that now they really haven't got a bloody clue what any of it does or what return it's delivering for them. And so actually, it is this idea that sometimes more is just more. It works for shoppers, it also works for you and your businesses. And so now is really time to make some choices, make some smart decisions based on real shopper behaviour. So that you're not just plugging in more wires into your organisation, creating more complexity for yourselves without having a clear understanding of what the return on that investment is. And it's also a question, as I said, about deciding, do you, want to, do you want to copy? Do you want to be an imitation of what someone else is already doing? Or do you want to be famous for something? Pick a direction, pick a course. Supported by data, supported by the right insights, and see where that takes your organisation. Now I'll move on to value and values, because I think there's a general sense that value just means private label, right? And to a degree, that's borne out in, uh, in our data. You can see the share of growth in Australia over the last 12 months coming from private label uh, is greater than its actual share. Uh, significantly more so than brand. But there's no doubt this is a, this is a key battleground. But, um, or I should say and, when we talk to shoppers, this is a little bit like, uh, I think Liz mentioned earlier, you, you get reported behaviour when we ask questions. You do get this sense of a, a fixation on price. I always compare prices. I consider price the most important factor. If it's all about price, price, I want to put another cent in my pocket. And then you, you hear this addiction to promotions. I actively seek out promotions. 60% of people saying I'll buy a brand I wouldn't normally just because it's on promotion. So it really does kind of compound this sense that everybody just wants this cheap private label stuff. They just want it on promotion. Now, it's not actually the case, because if it were, then this sort of thing would be okay and we'd see more of it. But we're not, thank God. We're seeing less of it. And actually, uh, the proportion of basket spend on promotion has stabilised. It was 33.8% uh, I think last year, and it's 336 this year. So what we saw on the last slide has to be taken with a degree of caution. And what we really believe is that the what and the who and the how are becoming more and more important. It's not just a price game. It's really also about um, provenance and traceability and sustainability. And people all over Australia are increasingly involved and uh, impacted and interested in nutritional cues and uh, where things have come from and how they were produced. And they're also more sceptical, more cynical about some of these claims. You can't just print any old stuff on the label and people go, oh, right, yeah, sounds good. People more questioning of those uh, messages. So you start to get into this idea, not just of value, but of values. What's important to us? You take uh, something like wellness. Wellness, what does wellness mean to you? It could mean a lot of different things. Is it about your diet? Uh, is it about what you do, the exercise that you take? 
Maybe it's about what you look like, or how you look, I should say. And then a significant group of people think about ethics. And so now you're very much into this territory of, um, I do want value, but I also want to uh, engage with brands and products and companies that, that operate the way that I think they should. And they support the kind of ideals that I have in life and uh, the kind of ethical stance that I take on things. And so now you're talking about value and values. And this is very telling in terms of this equation. So it isn't just, um, uh, it isn't just a, a, a about attributes. It isn't just about what um, a product does, being healthy or healthier. It's about all this kind of stuff as well. It makes things more complicated. Social well-being, financial well-being. Indulgence is a big, big thing, as well as ethics and sustainability. So there are really very uh, clearly two aspects to this argument. Now, it doesn't mean to say that there isn't going to be more pressure on food businesses around things like ingredients. And a lot of that is likely to be driven by uh, the media, or media hype, or media hysteria even. And we can see very clearly when we look at categories that have been affected, for example, over the last couple of years by the, um, the assault on sugar, all of these categories heavily impacted. And the contrast there, of course, being bottled water. So that's going to continue to happen. We'll all have to be cognizant of that. But it doesn't mean that we should take those things in isolation. Now, as a result, I come back to the, the point about private label. Yes, private label is, is here to stay. Yes, it's going to grow in prominence. We're going to see it becoming more sophisticated. We already see this in, in Europe, certainly in uh, Jan's homeland. You see very sophisticated private label ranges, and we'll see that increasingly here, whether it be uh, uh, tailored to specific dietary needs, specific ethical stances, um, or even this idea of premiumization and, and celebrity. I know you have a bit of it. Uh, good old Jamie Oliver, I see, has, has left the UK, thank God, and, uh, and come down here. Maybe Heston will as well. Um, oh, he has, he has already, good, he's, he's working with Coles. You'll see more and more and more of this, because it appeals to these, these two dual levers, the value and the values. And I just thought this was interesting. Uh, we came across this in our, in our research. Can Star Blue, um, a kind of, uh, I suppose, compare the, compare the market type um, outfit I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. There's only one grocery chain that has received this five-star rating for value for money in this country. Any guess who it might be? Of course it is. Of course it is. I think that's quite telling. When you think about what the message is that we have generally about, oh, it's a discounter. And people were still saying, well, my sister-in-law wouldn't shop there until, until I converted her a few weeks ago. She said, oh, the quality's not great. Uh, it's, it's, got, you know, it's not good quality. Well, and she gave it a go, and now she's converted. So it's interesting how uh, perceptions can change very quickly. Kaufland coming down, Costco, perceptions and fragmentation are going to continue to impact uh, your markets here. So to be that green shoot again, uh, it's very, very clear to us when we look at product and skew level that every product has to have a purpose. We have to be talking about what it does, not just what it is. Okay, it's not just what's inside it, it's what it's going to do for us, it's what it's going to do for the shopper. And we have to get that message right. Uh, I think, again, thinking back to what Liz was saying, uh, the message on the bottle is very, very important. It's just not about putting any old thing on there because, oh, well, the shopper will buy into it, it will be okay. In this fragmented market, you have to get it right. So then let me leave you with some, some ideas. And when we, we do our, our research into, uh, into categories and products, we pick out a particular areas where we've seen growth, where we've seen innovation, and we talk about um, some of those things. I'll come on to that in a minute. I'm sure you've all got an opinion on uh, Dan Murphy's, bit Marmite or Vegemite, I don't know, does, does that expression work over here? Um, some people will love it, some people will hate it. Whether you do or not, it's kind of beside the point, because um, for me, this branch in Mossman is possibly, bar none, one of the best uh, retail experiences that I can remember seeing in this country for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the information, the education that they have in store. The communication, digitally, connecting different parts of their business, being connected, as Jan was talking about, putting the, uh, the shopper at the center of what they're doing. 
Uh, again, more information, education, quirky, fun, helping those uh, people in the middle, the, uh, the explorers, right? Giving them something to, uh, to, to be getting on with. Helping them at the shelter as well. And there's value, there's value cues in there. I mean, uh, something that does kind of shock me is that you can sell a uh, $35,000 bottle of wine next door to a $5 one, but hey, it seems to be working for them, so I guess they're, uh, they're satisfied there. It's my favourite of all. A uh, very average group of men uh, sipping wine around a, a tasting, uh, tasting table uh, on a Thursday evening. Very Mossman, that. Very Mossman. But, you know, it's engagement with the product. It's uh, the guy there in the check shirt at the back. He's the, he works at Dan Murphy. He's a very nice guy. He'll always stop and chat and talk to you about the product. He'll always give you five minutes. Uh, he's not just trying to push the most expensive bottle on you. He's really got a passion for the product and a real interest in engaging with shoppers, and if we translated that across all of our organizations, it doesn't have to look like that, but I think that'd be a great, great place to start for innovation and inspiration. Now, if you look at a uh, more kind of granular level, you can see some very interesting things with particular products. Chobani is um, an American firm, I think it started off only in 2005. Uh, they've taken, uh, I know, the concept of yogurt, is that concept? But they've taken the trend of yogurt produced a whole versatile range around it, and particularly this uh, flip product, driving all of that growth in the category from virtually nothing, and turning yogurt into something that isn't just a breakfast thing or a morning thing, uh, but turning it into a snackable uh, afternoon occasion. So what they're doing is just thinking about something that's very on trend, very popular at the moment, and putting a different spin on it. Now, how can you do that uh, in different places and in different in different categories. In the other end of the spectrum, you've got a very well established brand. Maltese has been around since, I don't know, 1935, 36, something like that. Uh, over in the UK a few years ago, they took this, this radical leap into a bar format. That sounds quite funny when you say it like that. It's not, not that massive a leap of faith, but they haven't done it for the previous 80 years. And then all of a sudden they did. It becomes like a more indulgent thing. And then they've replicated that here. They've seen that kind of growth. And the next step, then, is further uh, meaningful innovation, putting themselves in more of a convenience uh, territory, putting themselves in the frozen aisle, even putting themselves at the checkout there. That was from uh, an Aldi that I went to recently. So meaningful, meaningful range extension that broadens the appeal of the brand definitely works. And the only bar item in the top 40 uh, that's, that's grown in the last 12 months. And then the last one of these, again, just taking a very standard, a very staple product, and you know where you stand with rice and when you can consume it, putting a different spin in it, picking out something, again, some very on-trend ingredients, quinoa, brown rice, packaging it differently, uh, appealing to a different audience, a different segment, a different shopper, and creating, in effect, uh, different, different meal occasions and different opportunities to consume. I love this. I always keep these in my drawer at work. I don't know how many people said that, but one person at least. And again, you see the growth that's coming from it. Um, so it's about uh, convenient versatility, if you like. And then uh, I just wanted to throw this up because I came across this a few days ago. The, uh, the company I used to work for in the UK holds uh, an online and digital conference every year. And uh, this year they had a bunch of guys from FMCG businesses. Kellogg's was one of those. And much as there's a lot of debate in this country about the impact of Amazon and how that's going to impact uh, existing players and existing suppliers, so too there's the same debate in, uh, in the UK, except it's, it's kind of here and over here it's a bit further out, but still pretty close. And uh, one of the guys from Kellogg's was saying was e-commerce doesn't have to equate to Amazon. The two are not synonymous, again, it's like choice and range, not necessarily the same thing. And what they're exploring is, um, is just thinking outside the box. Because the market is fragmented, because there are many different ways now to get to the consumer, the retailer doesn't hold all the keys. The retailer has a box into which things go. But shoppers aren't necessarily going into that box. They might be going for an Airbnb, in which case they might not really know where they are. They might not know the area. So what better uh, partnership than to say, OK, well, you can order your Kellogg's cornflakes through Airbnb to be at that place where you're going to be in a week's time, because you don't know the area, and we're just taking the hassle off 
you know, off your plate, making it easy. It hasn't actually happened yet, but uh, it's something they're exploring. And just maybe think, God, if you, if you really open the doors creatively to who you could partner with and where your product could sit, then um, there could be some great opportunities like that in different places that people haven't even thought about. Because that's the way we're living our lives now. And we aren't all going to go to big boxes and fill trolleys full of stuff and cart it home over the next two, five, 10, 15 years. So when I think about innovation and uh, inspiration, we have to deliver on an experience, much like that Dan Murphy store, undoubtedly an experience, like them or not, you can't say that they weren't delivering an experience. Uh, this whole concept of being conveniently versatile is very important. New twists on products, uh, new ways that they can be consumed, and, and certainly the last example gives you a sense that if you look beyond the norm, there's a whole world of opportunities out there. It just takes a bit of creativity, a bit of information, a bit of data, something to support your argument, and able to make that business case internally, and then go and try and strike out for that. And, um, and this is where you can get to. So if you focus on choice, you focus on value, you focus on innovation, you have to do a million things. If you did one thing in each of those areas fantastically well, then uh, you're not going to be falling between those cracks as this market fragments. You're going to be one of those green shoots. And the beautiful thing about it, and I've always said this in any presentation, is it doesn't matter how far behind you think you are today or how far forward you think you are today, it's never too late to do something today and to set yourself on a different path. And I'm sure, as I said at the outset, that businesses in South Australia are primed for that challenge and for that opportunity. Thank you. You can ask me some questions, but do bear in mind I've been in this country for four months, so Jan will be answering all of those questions. <laughs> Anyone for anything? What we can talk about. Hello. Uh, questions, actually. Okay. Uh, this one is, do you see on the one, I'm talking on the one side of things, uh, do you see any, any movement due to regulations uh, according to the development of one online this is going on? I'm not going to profess to be an expert on that. In fact, Mark, you might even have a better view than that on me. Than me. No, I'm not going to take any regulation questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Is there anyone who want to make this better? Try number two. What's number two? Uh, the number two is uh, there's a few studies showing that the wine shelves are not that much influenced by the number of wines that you got oh, right, right. on that. So uh, how do you feel that? It's uh, the reality to that in the long uh, I don't have a statistic to hand, but I'm sure we can delve into that sort of thing. Uh, I, I Personally, I find that hard to believe. Uh, I suppose it depends what kind of segment you are when you're at the, the shelf edge. But um, I, I find it very hard to believe that there isn't some sort of correlation. I'm sure that we can look into some information to, to correlate that or to cross-reference what you've seen. But I'd also be interested to see what, on what basis they've said that there isn't that relationship. Uh, it's a big study done in New York City uh, uh, where we looked at the number of shelf lines that you got there and what was the, the sales revenue developed by that. And yeah, we couldn't yeah. find any, any impact, and the wine was one of the few items that was not impacted by that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can definitely, uh, I, I would say, we can shed light as we have done with the, uh, the Grocery Category. So they'll be in those 300 that we track. Uh, by all means, give, give us a shout afterwards, and we can uh, we can have a look. I find it hard to believe, but uh, prepared to be um, proven wrong. Tony, just a two. I will have a question about the um, your comments about the reduction in ranging um, being more appropriate for um, bricks and mortar retailers. But surely the opposite is true for their online part of their business. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if I if that's what it sounded like, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't I would agree with that. Actually, I wasn't making that point. I think uh, if you you consider online and what an Amazon or an Akara does, you talk a lot about the endless aisle. Uh, and actually, Amazon will, will typically when they talk to suppliers, they'll say, "We'll take everything. You know, we want we want to have access to everything that you do and everything you can do." So no, I, I would absolutely say that it's um, it's inverse. But then the way that you present it online. From a from a, an experience, user experience, and interface point of view, has to be 
uh, very carefully managed. So you, you might have access to it, but then your taxonomy and the way you structure things on the website has to be just as careful as what you would do in a, in a physical store. Uh, awful lot of work going on in, in uh, Europe where they're finding these problems because um, the information from the images isn't clear or you can't tell what the product is very easily. Uh, it's this classic one about Coke. Uh, if you just have a bottle of Coke, you don't necessarily know how big it is. Um, so you have to provide some of the cues so that people can establish what it is that they're ordering. But from a range point of view, you have to get the, um, the labeling right and the keywords right uh, so that people can actually search in a different way. It's about understanding then how does somebody online search from you know, here down to the product they want versus what they would do if it was in front of them. And, it's, and it is quite different. And you, you have to be aware of that as you, uh, as you start to go into e-commerce. Just a follow-up question to that then. Um, in your experience in the UK, mm. did Amazon entering the market and bringing wine online, that increase overall wine sales? Or did they just cannibalize existing mm. sales growth? I, uh, I have a feeling, I can't say definitively, but there, there is a, definitely a line of argument that says that it's, it's, a, it's a category growing effect that Amazon has in a lot of cases. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that everyone is going to win out of that because you've still got to appeal to these, you've still got to have choice in the right places, convenience, value, values. But actually, a lot of people talk about its negative impact and the destructive effects, but there is all evidence to suggest, I believe, that it has a positive impact and it actually can grow, uh, grow categories because the, the reality is, and it comes back to uh, Jan's point, connected consumers and, and c customer centricity and um, dynamic paths to purchase mean that not everyone is going to want to always go online to buy that bottle. People will want to go into a store, people will want to look at it, they want to touch it, feel it, see what the label's like. So there are undoubtedly going to be opportunities. Uh, if it's in front of me online, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to buy it from that person at that moment in time. That's, that's the reality of it. So there are ways in which it can be a positive uh, growth factor for, for a category as a whole. I believe. Are we done? You have some more. So in and around unlabeled, compared to in Europe and the UK, where in each country there are more chains, and therefore greater need to differentiate between each chain. Yeah. Compared to Australia, where you've got two major chains. Yeah. What's the uh, end result within that? Um, you've also then differentiated between home labels and say cold or water, sort of, or is it home Bailey and Bailey or whatever the disguised yeah. home labels? And uh, it, what, where's the similarities, differences, opportunities in that space? Uh, what are you mean? So, this is the question what's the opportunities for development? Well, how, how does it compare? In a market which has got you know, fewer retail options yeah, in yeah. terms of own label, its penetration compared to where there's more differentiation. Right. right. Um, so a couple of observations I made. I think uh, there's 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 two big opportunities for uh, first of all for private label to be increased overall across those big stores uh, as an absolute proportion of range, and it's it is much higher. I, I think if I remember back now, you're looking in. Tesco or Sainsbury's in the UK at um, uh, upwards of sort of 60 odd percent of products in our private label. I mean, it's very, very substantial and it's the focus of all of their advertising. So I think there's, an, there's opportunities for increase in absolute terms. I think the other big, big opportunity that you see in Europe and you don't really see here as, as clearly, or I haven't picked it out yet, is tiering within that private label. Good, better, best as a concept. I'm making a sweeping generalisation here, but as a concept, it's completely missing in, in, in the uh, stores that I've been into. And it's, and it's bewildering. Even the difference between a, a private label and an own brand, which, which can be confusing anyway, but as you said, private label, you don't have to, um, you don't invest as much in a private label. It doesn't have the heritage. If you put your name on it, its own brand, it's quite a different proposition. The tiering is not here yet. Uh, and it's, that's a big, big opportunity, I think. Could I add to that from a wine consumer mm, point mm. of view? Um, I'd say that overall, consumers are really not aware of what private labels are in, in the two main retailers. And once consumers do know, they don't really like it. So, but they have no idea because a lot of the brands are sort of mirrored on <coughs> traditional labeling and things like that. So 
Um, I guess that's quite different to things like the UK. I think it's Majestic, you know, go, this is our own wine, and it's a, I think it's Majestic. Anyway, it's one of the retailers, and they kind of seem to own it a bit more. Like, this is our selection, and we handpick what we like and everything like that. But in Australia, it's still quite hush-hush. You have to turn the label around and look who it's bottled for or who it's, you know, created for, etc. But um, anecdotally, consumers, once they're informed, that label's actually owned by this retailer, that label's owned by this retailer. They prefer to gravitate towards the community kind of um, connected, I would like to support the little guy. And it's sort of the same when they hear brands are owned by, you know, the average punter doesn't know that one big brand owns 15 small brands because they see each brand as, you know, I've been told many times it's a, brand owned by a big brand house and I've been told by consumers, oh there's this cute little brand, it's got like a nice label and I think it's, I think it's from the Barossa and it's really nice mm -hmm. and you know I'm not going to tell them well it's actually owned by a huge global company but yeah they do like the idea that they're kind of buying and supporting a smaller brand that helps in terms of the retail discussion. I think that's where Foodland here in South Australia is, is because I've done some uh, digital advertising stuff for them is their niche into small batch producers and all that concept to differentiate from Audi and Coles and mm. all that noise that's going on at the moment. And, and Foodland stand to do quite well, I think, with that. And um, I noticed that in that uh, wine thing you showed there where people were tasting the wine, mm. uh, the new Foodland down at Brighton here, that will actually get exactly that. Yeah. Celebrations will actually have a huge, uh, they've got a huge area in the new development there. And uh, they'll have the tasting table and all sorts of things. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, if, if you get that right, that small uh, s small supplier, small producer province story, then it's very hard to, to copy and replicate as well. And uh, I've heard lots of good stuff about, about food, like particularly in uh, South Australia. So I think that's a valid point as well. Okay. Thank you very much. There we go.